Okay, let's get started. Lecture module four, input output. Input output, in my opinion, this, this chapter is probably the easiest in the textbook. Why? We're all pretty much familiar with input output. We use it every day. Let's recall, though, that input processing output is seen at many different levels. We saw it at the CPU level with the fetch execute cycle simulation. We're now look at, going to look at it from a, a personal computing perspective. So whether it's a PC, a Mac, a phone. And then down the line, we're going to see it at the information systems level. So input processing output. So before we begin, something that's not in the textbook, because whenever we talk about input output, and really, this would go with file formats as well. We need to start looking at digital rights management, DRM, and, and ethics as well. There's a fundamental difference between physical things and digital things. So if we look at this, physical entities wear out. They're replicated at the expense of the manufacturer. So as an example, we could easily reverse engineer a car. Great. But to actually make a car, there are very high production costs. Physical things exist at a tangible location. And when sold, you sell a car, you no longer own the thing. Very different from information and digital items. <clears throat> information never wears out. It can become obsolete or untrue. It can be replicated at virtually no cost without limit. So we look at any, you know, an MP3 file. I can copy a song, I can copy a movie digitally and hand it to someone. It exists in the ether. When sold, the seller still retains the information. Again, if I rip a CD and distribute the MP3 files, okay, I still have that CD. Now I may or may not still be able to use it. And I'll give the example of say a Microsoft Office CD. Microsoft Office CD, of course, to use it, you need the serial license code so i could have copy it and distribute it but as soon as someone else installed it microsoft would identify that there are two copies out there so again and the last thing information is costly to produce so you think about a music item a, a movie okay large sunk costs however you can replicate it so the pricing on the object is really there to recover the sunk cost, the cost of making the movie, the cost of making the music song or whatever it is. Okay, so we're going to jump right to the textbook. I'm not going to cover this in its entirety. A lot of it is very straightforward, and I'm going to add some things too. <clears throat> Again, when we talk about input-output, we focus – you know, the text focuses on the technology, but we have to understand or at least assess the greater impact. Because now, of course, everyone has a camera on their phone. And what's the impact? What's the social impact of that? Well, news reporting, social media, things of this nature. It's just, it's really changed the world. We're going to start, you need to understand the technology acceptance model. And this is not in the textbook, but you do need to recognize it. The technology acceptance model looks at technology and, well, how people will accept it. And it's based on two dimensions, perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. If something is just straightforward and very easy to use, an iPad, okay, there's, a, there's almost no learning curve to it, and people will just embrace it. So they can obviously see the utility. In other areas, you say look at computer-aided design, architects, engineers. Anybody do CAD in here or have experience with CAD? It's a steep learning curve. It's like this. It's a wall. It's vertical. Um, so to use it requires significant effort. The common person is not going to overcome this hurdle to use CAD. Who will? An architect, an engineer, because they see the utility. In the long run, once they learn how to use computer-aided design, it'll make their job easier. So the technology acceptance model, two dimensions, perceived usefulness, perceived ease of, ease of use. If it's a very low perceived ease of use, the technology will be adopted. Camera on a phone. Everybody uses them, right? Easy to use. 
Whereas some things have a very steep learning curve, require significant expense for the person to learn how to use it. So they have to see that, okay, in the end, it's going to be useful. I added another thing here. Um, HCI is short for Human Computer Interface. And there's a tenant out there, and this applies to software design, it applies to web design, and many things. If the user cannot find the functionality, it may as well not exist. And you've probably seen this. You see these great applications, great functionality. But if the user can't find that functionality, what's the use of it? So interface design is, is critical as well. So keyboards. Anyone here never use a keyboard? OK, moving on. Um, no, a couple things that we do need to note, though. Keyboard, of course, displays our alphanumeric keys. And we understand now that when I type a K or a J, that K or J is not going into the computer, right? There's a symbolic encoding. What encoding do we use, by the way? Not ASCII. We've moved on from ASCII to be ASCII, but also Unicode. OK, so know that. Um, within a, just a PC here, it's ASCII. When you move out to like an internet approach or a networked approach, we need a greater vocabulary of letters, so we use Unicode. <clears throat> Pointing and touch devices. And I failed to mention, while today will be straightforward and I'm gonna blow through a lot of this stuff because it's things that we use every day, tomorrow is one of the best classes of the semester because we get to look at all the new input and output technologies. And there's some stuff out there that will just blow your mind. So pointing devices, well, we know about the mouse, the stylus. If anyone has never, I, I brought my micro, uh, excuse me, my Mac Magic Mouse, but for the life of me, system, the ITS has Bluetooth turned off on this, so I cannot um, hook it up. Anybody ever used a Mac Magic Mouse? So one or two? The entire top surface is actually a touch sensitive. So it's actually you, just by moving your finger, you can move the cursor as well. And when I first tried it, what, what were your first impressions? It was weird. But it was it's, weird. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's useful. Yes. It when takes it, a little curve. Yep. Well, again, you know, technology acceptance model, perceived ease of use and, and perceived usefulness. When I first tried it, I didn't like it at all. And then I didn't have a mouse, and I used it for a couple days, and suddenly, I can't go back to a normal mouse just because what I can do with scrolling two fingers, three fingers, pinches, zooms, right on the mouse without moving things. And of course, moving the mouse also moves the cursor. Um, anybody using pen styluses on their tablets or something like that, Surface Pros? None. I like them, but I lose pens and I lose styluses. So, you know. touch screens, of course, we're very familiar with our phones things like that. Slowly, we're seeing adoption. You know, of course, the Microsoft Surface Pro. Slowly, we're seeing adoption into monitors as well. Know that gesture-based and thought-based computing is here. And, and again, tomorrow, we're going to look at a couple of these things. And it's incredible what is taking place. I'm not going to say anything about the mice or mouse. I'm not going to say anything about pens or styluses. Anybody ever use handwriting recognition? Couple, what'd you think? Sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. With my handwriting, it would never, ever work. Um, so, again, moving on. Graphics tablets exist, you know, for the fine arts, for editing, things like that. Touch screens, it is going to be a quick, quick class. Scanners, what do we need to know about scanners? Scanners, cameras, they're doing, they're operating under the same principles. So essentially they're overlaying a grid over whatever it is and then they're sampling within each cell. Now we've already covered this, right? If I, I can have grayscale, which of course can be encoded with one byte per cell. For the most part though, we move to color, RGB, red, green, and blue. So we have a byte for the red component, a byte for the green component, a byte for the blue component. And I just added a slide, so I'll show this in just a minute. So we have roster or bitmapped graphics. Does anybody recall the major other category? No, nope, that's a type. Vector-based. 
okay? Vector, we know from mathematics, what is a vector? It's a magnitude and a direction. But when we look at vectors, we're really talking about objects, polygons, things of this nature. Bitmapped or roster graphics do not resize well. Whatever the resolution is that we first take the picture or first make the scan, that's it. You can go smaller, and it'll look, it'll look fine. But as soon as you go larger, if I double the size of a picture, every cell is going to become four cells. So that's what gives it that jagged appearance. And I actually, add, again, added an image that'll show it really, really well. So I can't really talk about this. Um, once that initial resolution is set, it's set. So I just copied this because this is dramatic. So essentially, this is what multiplying it by who knows, 16 times. And you can really see, of course, where the one pixel here, it does look like a curved surface. As soon as you expand that out and that one pixel becomes 32 pixels, it starts to look very jagged. And then, of course, each cell will have different red, green, blue components. So again, this is referred to as how many bit color when I have RGB? 24-bit color, right? I'm storing the red, the green, and the blue, each in a separate byte. Byte is 8 bits, 24-bit color. Does anybody remember what I said? When we move to 32-bit color, what can we add? What is it? Transparency, surface properties. You know, the surface is shiny, the surface is dull, so things of this nature. Readers, barcode readers, barcodes, okay, they're still out there. Great uses. Um, we do our Christmas shopping for my daughter using one. You know, we'll just go out to a Toys R Us and scan everything and get the best price added to the Amazon shopping list, and, and there you go. Anybody using QR codes? Yes? Okay. The best was uh, ordering food from your seat at the Joe Brown Stadium. I didn't know that. And the menu comes up. And they brought it right to your chair. <laughs> that is great. I had no idea. Um, fantastic. I usually present this a little later. I'll present it now because that's is perfect marketing. A lot of marketers don't realize that marketing is now IT. Business today is all analytics closing the loop. And you think about marketing still uses radio ads. They still use, use all these things. Well, that's broadcast. And trying to assess how successful a broadcast you know, is, is very difficult. I put this ad in the newspaper. Sales went up. Was it because of that? I have, you have no idea. You think about radio ads. What do they say? You know, Use this code. When you go online, enter code, whatever. Because this allows the marketers to trace it back. Oh, that listener bought this. They were listening to that radio show. So now I know that this type of listener is listening to this type of radio show. Then you think about what QR codes can do. And I'll use the example of some banner ad in Crossgates or <laughs> back of a stadium seat. But I'll, I'll use the Crossgates example. And there's a banner ad there with a QR code. And if someone snaps that with their phone, right, they're being led to a website. The website can determine what is their platform. You know, is it iPhone? Is it an Android? And there's certain assumptions you can make just based on that. What about time of day? If someone is snapping that at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, well, they're probably not a student, at least high school student or K through 12. So it's probably someone who doesn't work, stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad. So you're starting to get demographic data, things like that. Suddenly, you know, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, you get a whole bunch of snaps on it. Okay, schools are out. So there's all this marketing information that you can gather if you just change it from a broadcast to a two-way communication. And QR codes can do exactly that. Um, it's all about the linkages, and we're going to look at some things. There's a lot going on beneath the scenes of profiling and predictive analytics. And our privacy is at stake. But we'll look at that when we get to computer security. 
So it's very easy to create QR codes. I just included a link here. You can put text in there and create it that way. You can put, of course, URLs, you can pictures, things of this, many, many things here. You're starting to see some of these certain parts of this are actually editable, and you can actually put logos and things like that in a QR code as well. RFID. RFID is one of the things being used to usher in the Internet of Things. And we're going to look at the Internet of Things when we get to networking. The Internet of Things is essentially our environment is going to become sensor rich. And I'll throw out the term, it will reveal a lot of dark data. Dark data is data that was previously undiscovered. I think I gave the example of Best Buy with the the cameras at the front of their store, you walk, they walk, you walk in, Best Buy found out that 95% of the people turn right. Dark data, previously undiscovered data. So you start putting sensors throughout the environment and they just start reading things. And you're gonna learn a lot about people's behavior for good and for bad. So Walmart uses our RFID in their shipping. It allows them to change destinations. Snowstorm comes up and a truck is stopped somewhere you know, in the Midwest, and it has lettuce, and it was going to New York. But because it's stopped now, and if you look at the travel time to New York, by the time it gets to New York, New York the stuff's gonna be bad. So Walmart can read that, re-divert it to a local store, sell it for you know pennies or whatever, have a Walmart special, and at least they can recoup, recoup some of their money on that. RFID chips, they can be used for both good and bad. There was a high-end luggage company that started putting RFID chips in their luggage. Why, you know, and, and the, the luggage is real high-end. So the people who would own this luggage, of course, are using chauffeurs, valets, things of this nature. So the chauffeur, of course, would show up to pick up the luggage, and they would have no idea what it would look like. So they'd have an RFID scanner, and they'd sit there by the turnstile at the, at the airport. You know, their alarm would go off, and they'd grab the luggage. Great. But crooks started understanding this because if you have luggage that costs two to three thousand dollars, what do you think is in it? Okay. Yes. So now the crooks in the airport would just walk through the airport with one of these readers. They, they you know, get flagged that there's a suitcase there that costs two thousand dollars. They nab it. OK. Many other good uses. And these are some of the first uses. Some wine companies started putting RFID chips in their in the corks of their bottles. And this was done a lot out in California. So when you took one of the bottles off the shelf, put it in your shopping cart, the shopping cart would read it and come up with the wine speculator report, as well as add the price to your total. So you know exactly how much your shopping cart contained. So we'll see this more and more for both consumers, stores, things of this nature. But we'll also see RFIDs allow us to add internet of things type functionality very inexpensively. So, and again, we're going to look at this more when we get to the IoT. So, scanners, readers, okay, we know about, you know, tracking inventory, all these things. And again, it's, it's evolving to where our phones with the right software can do all of this. You know, typically, traditionally, we always had these dedicated handhold scanners. You've seen them in stores, of course. You can do everything now with a phone and tags because the phone of course has the camera has the built-in processing so and of course it's connected so you can keep a centralized accounting i'm not going to say anything about optical mark readers optical character recognition um anybody have scanners on their phone by the way a few i recommend them okay especially in an educational environment um I forget what I have, and who knows how dated they are. But the scanners today will perform OCR, optical character recognition. So you have to imagine just being in the library and doing research. You know, just snap a picture of the page. Have it changed to text, and you can actually import that directly into a paper as a quote. Save as PDF, whatever you want to do there. Great for if you're just doing research. And everybody does this, you know, we take pictures of license plates, we take pictures of everything. But again, with a proper scanner that can move to text, if you're doing research in the library, take a picture of the, the title and that, that information for your bibliography. And again, cut and paste, drag it right in rather than retyping it. 
So I do recommend you get a good, and they're all free these days. So get a good scanner on your phone. Blow through it. This, this I can't believe is still in the text. Uh, people are taking pictures of their checks and depositing, depositing them with their phones. So I don't even say anything. <laughs> Biometric. I'm going to add some content here. You're not responsible for it until we get to computer security. There are three levels. And recall on the first day, I presented authentication and authorization, right? When you log in to Blackboard, you are identi identifying yourself. You give your username and password. The system then checks its files. Is there such a user? And does that, do I have recorded that user's password and does it match authentication? There are three levels of authentication in computing. There's something I know, which is the lowest level, something I have, middle, and something I am. So something I know, username and password. Something I have, uh, RFID dongle, a USB, something I have to put into the computer because I actually have to possess it. So if someone walks up to the computer and doesn't possess that, of course, they cannot gain access. And then the highest level, something I am. Fingerprint, retina scan, something like that. Now, should one of these higher levels be used, typically the system will use two-factor authentication. So you'll not only have to put the USB chip, you know, dongle in, but you'll also have to provide your username and password, okay? Or fingerprint. Now, it's a little different, of course, we look at our devices, now have fingerprint scans, and it's just the fingerprint. You're not actually inputting your you know, username and password as well. Digital cameras, not going to say much. Tomorrow I will, hopefully remember to bring it in too, uh, present the Lytro camera. Has anybody heard of the Lytro? Um, L-Y-T-R-O. I found it on a website. It's a vector camera. So kind of share with what's coming tomorrow. We know about digital cameras, right? It kind of samples, overlays a grid, takes the red, green, blue elements, creates a roster or bitmapped image. The Lytro camera is very different. The Lytro camera captures the light vectors. You don't focus. It captures all the vectors coming in because we know that light is just a reflection. What does this allow it to do? You don't focus. You then take that file and download it to your computer. You can do it right on the camera as well. And then after the fact, you choose what to focus on. So I could just snap it here, and then with that file, I could focus on this, or I could focus on that chart over there by the wall and bring it into the focus. So focusing is actually done after the fact. Why is this important? It captures everything. Think about that. I give the example of the Boston Marathon bombing. If a single person had had the Lytro camera, and they were out then, and they're, they're down to like $99 now, there would have been none of this, let's collect all these photos, send them all off to the FBI and Quantico, and do all this extrapolation and try to figure out what this person looked like. With a Lytro camera, if one person had snapped on it, focus on him. APB out within 15 seconds. Very different, okay? So great applications. Forensics, you know? Um, criminal investigations, great. Privacy. What happens when you start putting these things on buildings? Because now, after the fact, what are they doing? What does that person have in their hand? What's their facial expression? Because now they can they can infer what you're up to from your facial expressions. You start putting these things on drones. The world is about to change in a very frightening way. Um, and Lytro, by the way, has just come out with, and it's very expensive, but a video solution. So you think about the way we do filmmaking now. You know, the director has the storyboard. I want the cameras here, here, here. And they just try to get it right because it's, you know, it's costing money. You move to the Lytro where they're capturing all these light fields. Just set them up and run. After the fact, okay, focus on that person's face. Take that, put that into focus. Take that out of focus. All What's that? All in, editing. All in editing. Yep. It's going to completely change the, the way that we make films. Um, 
but again, for surveillance, things like this, it's a, it's a little frightening. So I won't say much. Um, one of the things I, I did add just this, this morning, just to remind everyone, when we're looking, we're looking at compression, and we need to understand compression. There are two types of compression, lossy and lossless. Lossless compression, of course, I get everything back. And this is necessary for data, databases, files, things like that. You wouldn't want to write a Microsoft Word, you know, a term paper, compress it, uncompress it, and <laughs> half of it be gone. That would not be acceptable. We accept loss and compression where human perception is involved. So audio, MP3, okay? Because at 256, you know, bits per second or, or whatever the size is, I can't hear a difference between that and a CD. I just can't tell. Digital video, or actually any video, is inherently lossy, right? 24 frames per second. It's not like the video camera is capturing everything analog. It's taking 24 pictures a second, which is enough to fool our eyes to perceive motion, to, to perceive that it's fluid. Now, audio input. We've looked at how we create a bitmapped or roster image. What about audio? Audio is a waveform, correct? Okay, I can kind of draw it in the air here. But there's also a temporal component. So how is audio digitized? Well, you have a bit, rep, bit depth and a sampling rate. The sampling rate is over how many times per second am I going to sample this audio wave? The bit depth determines how correctly I sample it at each of these time points. So you can imagine if I, you know, I have an audio wave here in the air, if I have eight lines horizontal through the air, at any one given time, that line may or may not cross an intersection to where I can actually represent it. If I double that, triple it, quadruple it, and if I just draw many lines in the air, then I can more accurately capture where that audio signal is. So you can think of a sampling rate. If I look at an, an audio wave, the sampling rate will be vertical lines and the bit depth will be horizontal lines. So there's my grid on when I'm capturing that. And a lot of laymen, you know, people who don't really know, they talk about MP3s of bits per second. How many bits per second? And they think that that and that that does give a notion on how good a representation it is. So of course, the better representation will be how many samples per second, okay? If I have a very high number of samples per second, so if I look at digital audio, say CD quality, 44,100 samples per second. Vertical lines. 16 bits per sample, well, two to the 16 gives me how many different categories. So I can capture that fairly well, two stereo channels, and I get that 1.4 megabits a second. And again, keep in mind what we saw back in architecture. Small b denotes bits, typically in bits per second networking, whereas when I see a capital B, I'm talking about bytes. So if you're a network engineer, if you're designing a system, don't forget to make that conversion. Okay, voice input getting better and better. And there is a distinction between speech recognition and natural language recognition. Speech recognition is fairly straightforward. If you look at the way our words, our consonants, our vowels are constructed, it'll break them down into phonemes. So little parts of the word, and then it's just matching, okay? Sounded like this, the dictionary says, bring back this consonant, bring back this syllable. And that's what's taking place. Natural language understanding is very different. It'll then take a look at the entire sentence and parse it and see what makes sense. And it still struggles because again, the computer doesn't have context. You know, I can say the glass on a table. And if you're up here, you'd see that this table actually does have, you know, a little glass surface here. But from a computer standpoint, it would have no idea if I'm talking about the glass on the table or an actual physical you know, glass of water sitting on the table. Where and where, there and there. 
So natural language understanding can actually take a look at the full sentence and determine, oh, it's T-H-E-R-E -E rather than T-H-E-I-R. And our systems are getting better, better and better, Siri, things like that. I'll introduce this now. There is a difference between the way that Apple does it with Siri and the way that Android does it. Android is Linux. Android built the speech recognition into the, the operating system kernel. We haven't discussed what the kernel is, although you read it in Linux labs. It's the resident portion, the core part of the operating system. This is fantastic because now if you're out without a signal somewhere with no cell service, you can actually still use your voice recognition on your Android phone or tablet. It can be off in a metal, dictating a whatever. Very different. Apple, Siri is cloud-based, which means it's dependent upon your bandwidth and connection to, to the cloud. And you've probably seen this. You try to use it, and if you're in a very you know, area with poor service, Siri does not work too well. Why would Apple do this? Because there's marketing information. With Siri, every time you use it, of course, they are updating their profile on you. These are your preferences. These are your behaviors. In fact, if you ever go on Google and look at your ads preferences, if you use Google, Gmail, Chrome, something like that, take a look at your ads preferences, and they probably nailed you. They nailed me. And within a couple of years, they know my likes, my dislikes, and we'll take a look at that when we get to privacy in the web. Music input. I know we have a couple musicians in here. Um, and again, with music input, we do have that the need for that analog to digital conversion. Music also has a musical interface for digital, uh, a MIDI implementation as well, which is much shorter. And I won't, I won't go into it much here. Output. We're going to look at this extensively tomorrow. And we're going to go far beyond the text. Specifically, we're going to look at haptics, which is which is sensory. We'll look at holograms. We'll look at virtual reality and augmented reality, and a, and a few other things that are just too cool to believe. Displays. I'm not going to say anything about displays. Does anybody here not know what a monitor is? Okay, moving on. Typically, I don't learn about displays until I'm buying a new TV, or at least the new technology. So size and aspect ratio. Again, if you're a purchasing person, um, that's one of the, I've all, I always wanted to. I would love to be a purchasing agent for a company. It would be great just, just to continually research the latest and greatest out there in prices. One of the things we have to look at with display de devices introduces another concept. We talk about interfaces and whether it's the actual port or the adapter. And again, we shouldn't understand the, di the difference. Standards. Standards, I just added this. This is not in the text. Standards are necessary <clears throat> for heterogeneous device connections. If we didn't have standards, would be far less interoperable. I'll give the example of that three-prong plug, the three-prong electrical plug. I know that I can walk into Target, Walmart, wherever, and buy a coffee maker, buy a vacuum cleaner, buy a microwave. And I'm not going to have problems because when I come home, I have the standard interface for electricity, the three-prong plug. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we enjoyed the same standardization in computing. If you think back 10 years ago, you know, we had... VGAs, we had all these different USBs. Um, Apple had Firewire, all of these things. And slowly we're converging, USB. You know, finally we move from the parallel printer port to a USB port for printers. Great, one less port. So we're seeing this convergence. On the Mac platform, they're really moving and push, they've moved to and are pushing more and more for Thunderbolt, which is a very high speed. Although USB, when you look at the latest USBs, and we saw this, the speeds are excellent. So I won't, I won't say anything else there. We're beginning to see wireless displays, which is nice. 2D versus 3D. I've never really liked 3D. Again, it's a personal thing. We'll look at this tomorrow, wearable displays. 
Um, the first one of the first was the Google Glass. So again, and it did provide to some extent an augmented reality and we'll, we'll explore that further tomorrow. The Windows 10 HoloLens, has anybody seen demos of that? It, it's pretty incredible. It's, it's incredible. Anybody seen a price on that? It's like 3,000. Is it? I believe. Yeah, okay. You know? But will people be buying televisions in the future? Again, the cost will continue to come down. So at some point, everybody will have their own displays. I'll date myself here. Anybody ever see the movie Wally? -E, a Disney movie? Yeah. It's frightening. We're actually heading that direction. So um, I don't know to that extent. We'll see. Yeah. It was actually my daughter. Yeah. My, da my daughter's favorite movie when, I when she was like two years old. So, and of course, Wally, -E, if you listen to him boot, he's a Windows machine. And Eve, was it? The, you know, the white, nice, pretty new robot was a. Uh, when she booted up, she sounded like a Mac. So a little little dig there by Disney. Um, flat panels, I'm not going to say much about. LEDs are where we're at, of course. Um, OLEDs are pretty interesting. We're beginning to see flexible phones. Um, if you go on YouTube, they're out there. Flexible displays, so they can curve around a surface. You can roll them up. And that's one of the things we're going to look at when we get to mobile computing. Again, mobile computing, you look at the constraints, and what do we have? Well, limited input output, right? Small screen, tiny little keypad, battery life, processing. Well, cloud computing gives us the processing, overcomes processing. Input output, you look at voice recognition. Tomorrow I'm going to show you the world's first holographic cell phone display. It actually has a little hologram. You know, it's Star Wars. It's Princess Leia standing there on your phone. So we're moving that direction as well. But with flexible OLEDs, you can actually carry a monitor, right? Put it up on the wall. Although there are projectors out there too, and I'll show you those as well. So interferometric modulator, real low energy needs because they use mirrors. Now, of course, if it's using mirrors and available light, they're not going to work at night. But for something like, you know, in a daytime nature walk or something like that, yes, I, I can see I can see their use. Projectors, and we'll take a look at those tomorrow. And again, they're getting smaller. I'm not going to say anything about printers. Printers, again, you know, there are consumer printers and there are industrial printers. And you have to look at what is the service cycle, how many pages per minute, things of this nature. And then one of the things we'll look at in information systems, we'll define TCO, total cost of ownership, and ROI, return on investment. Because when I purchase a printer, the low cost printer may not provide the lowest total cost of ownership. You just look at inkjets versus lasers. Lasers are going to cost more right out of the gate. But over time, if you're printing a lot, that inkjet printer fluid is expensive. So you're gonna, you'd be better off getting a laser printer. Uh, very similar to scanners and monitors. Print resolution is measured in dots per inch. Of, of course, with monitors, we're actually talking about pixels. Not gonna say anything more about printers. Audio output. One of the things we'll look at tomorrow, has anybody ever seen a vibrational speaker? And they've been out for some time. Vibrational speakers will not actually have, say, a cone or a tweeter or anything like that. What they do is they will vibrate whatever object they're on and turn that entire surface or that entire object into a speaker. And they're out now. You can buy them now. It'll depend on what the object is. Of course, you can put it on a cardboard box and, you know, wood, you get a lot of bass. Glass, you get, it's just a crystal clear sound. So rather than carrying these big Bluetooth speakers around, slowly, more and more, we'll move to vibrational speakers, put it on a wall, and the wall becomes your speaker. I guess that's something like that on shirt. Yes, they're, they're very cool. Um, and they've been around for a while, so they, 
it is maturing. So I told you it would be quick, get you out early today. Tomorrow's the fun one. Um, I wish, maybe I'll, I'll try to bring my Mac tomorrow just so everyone can try this if they want. That's it. See you tomorrow.